Now, I think uh, uh, I will just very briefly introduce uh, the uh, first guest speaker before we take a break, so that we can then, uh, during the break, set up the video conferencing system for the speaker. So the first guest speaker, and I'm very happy that we have here uh, in the virtual lecture hall, Professor Vera Zabotkina. She is from the Russian State University for the humanities, which is, by the way, one of the reasons we had human memory, a lecture on human memory here, because it's very closely related. She's a very accomplished linguist. Um, um, so her research area is linguistics. But she's also, and I think that's one of the reasons she is interested in the Shanghai Lectures, a vice rector for international innovative projects at this university in, in Moscow and the director of the Center for Cognitive uh, uh, Programs. And she's a professor of the Department for Translation and Interpreting, uh, Interpretation. So we're very much looking forward to that lecture. And I think now it's time for a break. And during the break, we can set up the lecture hall in Moscow. Maybe, maybe we can start. So as I said before, I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Vera Zabotkina. Uh, and uh, she will be talking about linguistics, about conceptual metaphors. And I think I'm very happy that she will be talking about conceptual metaphors because that's something we haven't been discussing uh, a lot here. Now, there is uh, a lot of work on, uh, let's say, embodied cognition, for example, by uh, George Lakoff, Rafael Nunez, and uh, that work refers to, like there's, for example, one int very interesting book uh, called Where Mathematics Comes From, and they are arguing that even abstract mathematical concepts have their origin in the way our body is constructed. So there are a lot of bodily metaphors now on top of these bodily metaphors, you can build other metaphors, which are then the conceptual metaphors. So I think this uh, idea of conceptual metaphors can be directly connected also to the notion of embodiment. But now uh, we're very uh, keen to uh, listen to Professor Zabotkina about cognitive modeling in linguistics, conceptual metaphors. The floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Rolf. Um, it's really a pleasure and a privilege, and I thank everybody for inviting me. And um, it's been fascinating to be involved in this project, and we are very much honored. We are the only Russian university, and I'm trying to tell about our project in Brussels, in New York. People are amazed. So thank you very much, Rolf, for your enthusiasm and for your um, triggering us all the time and supporting our enthusiasm and motivating us. Uh, so what I'm up to today is cognitive modeling in linguistics. Uh, why linguistics when we are speaking about uh, robotics mostly? But uh, the problem is that language opens up the window to the mind. It's well known. And I'd like to remind also the uh, famous um, you know, quotation from Humboldt that language does not represent object but rather the concepts which in the process of speech have been formed by the mind, sometimes independent of the objects, which is a tricky question, of course. And then this famous example, when in Sanskrit, for example, the elephant is sometimes called the twice drinker, sometimes the double booted one, and sometimes the one provided with a trunk. So many different concepts are designated, uh, even though the same object is meant. So that means that we are really um, very much interested in the connection between the three worlds, the real world, the environment about which we've just spoken, the idea world, which is conceptual worldview, and the word world. And here the question arises, what is initial thought or word? So what is behind the thought? As you know, René Descartes uh, thought, uh, thought that behind the thought there is an obvious necessity, necessity of his own existence. And that explains why we call cognitive linguistic cogito ergo sum. I exist, that means I think. So I think that I'm 
existing only when I'm thinking. Then William James saw behind the sword a stream of raw sensory experience. That's what we are talking about. Ivan Sechenov, famous Russian biologist, he saw the individual action behind the sword. A very, I should think, provocative explanation gives uh, psychoanalyst um, Bayern. It's frustration born from ignorance. Very often we start thinking when we encounter or confront unknown thing, and that's how thought starts. Murab um, Mardashvili, a Russian philosopher, of Georgian origin thought that feelings, personal feelings, are behind the thought. Albert Einstein saw visual images and even muscular sensations behind the thought. Vygotsky, the great uh, Russian psychologist who defended his MA thesis at this university many years ago, and uh, Vygotsky saw the word behind the thought, and he saw emotional and volitional tendencies I'd like to quote from Vygotsky, the thought itself is born not from another thought, but from the motivational sphere of our consciousness, which encompasses our drive and mind, our needs, our interests and intentions, our affections and emotions. So I hope that question should arise now. What do you think? What is behind the thought? You as experts in robotics. Can I ask this question to any of the people in the room? Yes, absolutely. So who would like to... Apologies, so maybe you can repeat the question? Yes, what do you think is behind thought? So is it individual action? Is it sensory experience? Is it personal feelings? So what is behind thought? What do you think? What stands behind thought? Vygotsky thought that the word is behind thought, that every... Uh, Thought has a word behind it. That's why linguistics is important because the uh, thought lives in the word or lives through the word. So, do you do you agree with that? And if you think it's different, so what is your suggestion? What is behind the thought? Okay, I think that's a very good question. And since we're you know talking about embodiment and embodied intelligence, yeah. I think we can have an interesting perspective on this. Yes. Okay. Who would, right. Who would like to uh, volunteer? Yeah. Do we have uh, okay. a volunteer? Maybe we should leave it till later, at the okay. end of my lecture. Okay. Maybe I should proceed. Oh, there's somebody. Is there somebody Is who... Are in Berlin. Is there Berlin? Someone from Berlin? Yeah. Okay. Nobody. Okay, okay. so let's let's then proceed. Uh, let's maybe postpone the question to later. We still yes, have a session. Uh, we have a right. discussion session yes. at the end, right? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So before I embark on conceptual metaphors proper um, and interrelation between word and thought, I'd like to provide you with very brief theoretical underpinning on the question of what cognitive science is and what is the main challenge facing cognitive science. And of course, the main challenge facing cognitive science at the moment is integration challenge. How can we integrate? How can we create a general framework uniting all the branches, all the sciences within cognitive science? And as you can see, this is a famous cube or famous sector Hector um, uh, projection, uh, which uh, shows the links, the strong and not so strong links between the disciplines. You see that artificial intelligence and linguistics are connected by, sorry, by a very strong uh, link, and that means that we can speak about the relationship between linguistics and artificial intelligence. Um, less um, strong it's a connection between artificial intelligence and philosophy, artificial intelligence and anthropology. But for the past few years, uh, the number of um, branches of cognitive sciences have expanded, of course, as you know, and we have lots of new branches uh, between neuroscience and anthropology. We have neuroethics, neuroesthetics, 
uh, neuro art. Uh, last week we had here in Moscow a symposium on art and uh, artificial intelligence, um, and it was about you know connection of cognitive studies with the artistic presentations. So the main uh, challenge. Uh, for cognitive science is the challenge of providing a unified theoretical framework for studying cognition. And this framework should uh, bring together different disciplines studying the mind. So what are the possible answers? So the first possible answer is uh, so-called mental architecture, which is used in a broader sense than in artificial intelligence. It was suggested by Bermudez. And it shows how cognitive science can be united by one framework according to the uh, three dimension, dimensions. First, according to the type of cognitive activity being studied, according to the level of organization at which that type of cognitive activity is being studied, and the last but not the least, according to the degree of resolution of the techniques that are being studied. So, just different uh, dimensions of studying our conceptual cognitive systems and the ways information is processed in each or between these systems in our mind. Uh, the second possible answer is a famous, uh, you know, David Maas vision and his analysis of vision as a top-down analysis of cognitive system. As you remember, um, the first level is computational level. It's the analysis of the particular type of task that the system performs. The second is algorithmic level. Explains how information uh, processing tasks can be algorithmically carried out. And the third level is implementation level. Shows how algorithm is actually implemented. Though it was written 30 years ago, I mean, uh, this um, system, this um, uh, model, but uh, this year at the last uh, Cognitive Science Society meeting in Osaka, there was a special symposia, 30 years of Mars vision, levels and analysis in cognitive science, robotics and emotion. So uh, this model is criticized because it can be applied only to modular systems, but still we can build on it. So there are two possible answers, but um, now, when we try to shed some light on the main challenge facing cognitive sciences, in general, I'd like to pass over to the metaphors, uh, to conceptual metaphors. And of course, as you know, Lockoff and Johnson introduced this um, concept, and I'd like to quote, the concepts that govern our thought are not just matters of the intellect, they also govern our everyday functioning, down to the most mundane details. Our concept structure, what we perceive, how we get around the world, and how we relate to other people. So it overlaps with what Rolf said today, and I'm so happy that we are at the same wavelength. And of course, um, our conceptual system plays a central role in defining everyday realities. And of course, uh, if we are right in suggesting that our conceptual system is largely metaphorical, then we may think what we experience and what we do every day is very much a matter of metaphor. So, what is a conceptual metaphor? The traditional definition which everybody knows, I'd like to remind you, it's conventionalized cognitive structure. And these structures are based on mapping, mapping relations from a source domain uh, to a target domain, where the source domain, the source domain concepts, oh, sorry, mm, I've just, yes, pressed. The source domain um, mm, concepts are literal and more concrete and the target domain concepts are figurative and more abstract. So, some examples of uh, universal and culture-specific uh, conceptual metaphors. Universal life is a journey, politics is war, argument is war. They are well known. But maybe more interesting are culture-specific, such as time is money. Because we think about time, in terms of money, because we conceptualize time in terms of uh, source domain, money, we say save time, invest time, 
spend time, say valuable time, to live on borrowed time, and f further. Why? Why do we do it? Why do we use the verbs from the conceptual domain of money to speak about time? I'll elaborate on that later, but it's not in all cultures. It's only in European culture. In Korean culture, time is conceptualized as honor. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to our Korean uh, university. Is there anybody from Korea today? I Could they I give there, an example? I think there is, right? I think yes. there is, yeah. Can you give okay. an example? <clears throat> oh, that would be great, yes. Yes? <laughs> is it really true that in your, in your culture, time is not money but honor? And can you give some examples? Is it true? Okay. Any examples? I think we have a volunteer there, right? Go ahead. Yes. Can you switch oh. on the microphone? Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Unfortunately, most of our students in this class are not actually Korean, so we are not familiar with the culture of Korea. <laughs> okay, <Sorry>. I see. <laughs> okay, you're multinational. Right. Then, in the then next time, um, in the 20th century, time has become something new, I mean, new conceptual metaphor has appeared, time is a solid structure. Because we conceptualize, conceptualize time as a solid structure, we say time slot, time slice, time frame, and so on and so forth. These are just examples, and the latest are Earth is a greenhouse, Earth is a global village, Earth is a lifeboat. Um, also, world is a global casino. Because we have this conceptual metaphor in our cognitive system, we say to play the green card, we can compare it with traditional um, uh, conceptual metaphor, life is a gamble. Because this conceptual metaphor exists in our cognitive system, we say to take our chances, the odds are against us, to have an ace up one sleeve. Um, but if we go deeper to the... Um, origins of conceptual metaphors, we cannot fail to see that conceptual metaphors uh, go back to embodied cognition. They can be decomposed into combinations of simpler metaphors and ultimately to primary metaphors, which don't decompose further. And primary metaphors are motivated by embodied, by embodied experiences. Uh, for example, while children are held affectionately by their parents, the experience of affection correlates with the experience of warmth, and it leads to the conceptual metaphor, affection is warmth. That's what uh, George Lakoff um, told us about uh, at, in the con at the Congress in London this summer. Um, then, of course, we shouldn't forget that metaphors for emotions arise from internal body states. Ralph, I'm so happy that we are overlapping, so we cannot speak about okay, intelligence and cognition without body. For example, in anger, when we, are, when we are angry, the skin temperature and the blood pressure rise. Thus, anger can be conceptualized as the heat of a fluid that releases pressure. And because of that, we say, his blood was boiling, he left off steam. So. Another, another principle or another operation that lies at the basis of conceptual metaphors is, of course, analogy. It's bodily experience is first thing, but analogy. And again, you spoke about it today. So analogy is a universal mental operation that lies at the basis of conceptual metaphors. In assessing new information, humans create mental models by proceeding from existing knowledge. According to Johnson Laird, the, maybe the author of uh, mental models, uh, the theory of mental models, um, we uh, process the new information the following way. Based on the experience situation, the speaker builds analogous representations from which they can infer implicit information. So analogous, analogy is the main uh, cognitive operation here. And I'd like to remind about Jean Piaget's uh, theory, because he was the first to mention uh, the importance of bodily experience. You know, Jean Piaget is a Swiss of French origin, famous psychologist, and he um, 
just stated that during individual's active information processing, he or she integrates new information to the existing assimilating schemata. And this schemata, it's very important, are mostly originating from sensory motor experience of our body. In our childhood, even in babyhood, the, the baby learns the first cognitive models or creates by moving their hands upwards, downwards, forward, backwards, by interaction with the world. And, of course, it starts with the body. So analogy and uh, simulating schemata, again, are grounded in bodily experience. So now uh, back to um, more detailed explanation of what conceptual metaphors are. They are frame-to-frame -frame mappings with the roles of the source frame mapping to the corresponding role of the target frame. And of course, the mappings are not necessarily one-to-one. -one. There are cases where not, not all the roles fill us and uh, all the roles are mapped. And there are other cases where metaphorical roles are added to the target domain. So I'd like to uh, give some explanation on the time's uh, conceptual metaphors. I started with time as money metaphor, but it has never been like that. The first conceptual metaphor um, relating to time was time is God's gift. You can see the mapping from the um, source domain gift to the target domain time is done rather adequately and one-to-one. -one. What is in the center of the source domain of a gift given and receiver. Of course, we have value, we have purpose of a gift, we have usage, we have attitude towards a giver. And all these concepts are mapped on to the target domain. Examples. We humbly pray, mighty Father, that thou wilt prolong our lives for many years. From Dickens. Or in German, alle Tage, die Gott gibt. All the days that God gives. So I don't have to explain it because it's clear. But what happened in the 16th century, when trade started, Time has become conceptualized uh, as um, money. And the changes, the dynamics in the source domain can be traced down. So we don't have giver, if you can have a look. You see, in the center of the source domain, we have owner. The concept of giver has disappeared. Money has become possession, money has become commodity, and money has become, sorry, time. Time has become commodity. And that's why time is now conceptualized in those uh, terms of the domain of money, because trade, sale, cost, consumption, resource, and possession are important uh, components of time. Uh, we only end up, example, we only end up exploiting and devaluating each other's time. Then, second example, he was a slave to a gentleman who allowed him to buy his time. You know, slaves were sold and bought for a particular period of time. Uh, the new, or relatively new, um, conceptual metaphor nowadays, time is virtual entity. Uh, examples, and then I'll show you the changes in the source domain. Digital time um, is time as a sequence of numbers. We speak about computer time. Many people first experience the difference between the worlds of computer time and clock time. So now it's different. Then cyber time, and then I'd like to uh, quote the last one. Cyber time is quick time, based on the hyperspeed of the nanosecond. So completely new conceptualization of time. What happened actually here? The mapping, the mapping between the source domain and the target domain uh, has changed. Uh, as you can see, the time is now perceived through the conceptual domain of computer system. That's why the main prototypical features of time are now simultaneity, instantaneity, acceleration, solidity, abstraction, hyperfragmentation, compression. So all of these conceptual features of computer system are mapped onto the target domain of time. So um, now to go a bit deeper and to structure the frames of source domain and target domain, we can resort to a well-known uh, methodology, qualia structure, which was introduced by James Pustyovsky in his generative lexicon. Uh, the book is um, in my, on the website. Uh, so qualia structure analysis presupposes 
uh, four main roles or four main components of any um, word meaning, and these components are as follows. Constitutive, comp constitutive component, which denotes what object is made of, formal component, which means what category uh, the object belongs to, Telic, very important component, the function of the object, it denotes actions performed by the object and actions performed over the object. It's a very important component. And then the last but not the least, agentive, means how the object came into being. It may be artifact or nature fact, and depending on the origin, the uh, object behaves differently, and of course, the word meaning is different. I'd like to give you an example of the qualia structure noun cake, which is classical. So, the constitutive is floor and egg, the formal is physical object, telic, eat, and agentive, it is baked. So, this is the origin of cake. And if you now try to see how it works on the conceptual um, metaphors, we can see that we compare the original meaning of cake, which has been already explained, with the relatively new meaning of cake as an attractive girl or woman. What has changed here? The quality structure has changed. It's now human being, female, and telic. I mean, actions performed by the object or by the person is not uh, like in the previous uh, structure. Uh, it is to love and to be loved. And, of course, we can fail to see the difference. Eat, yes, there is some kind of mapping between eat and love. And, of course, people you know, speak about uh, a macro conceptual metaphor. Things that we desire are things that we'd like to eat. But food is a desire. But still, this method allows us to see the inner structure of this mapping process. What is mapped to what, depending on the uh, um, qualia structure uh, of their meaning. Another example, gender conceptual metaphors, women are birds. And if I give you an example of qualia structure of the meaning of the noun bird as an attractive girl or woman, you can see the difference uh, between the original meaning and the new meaning. It's human being, it's female, and again, telic, the action to love and to be loved. So, I, I know that I'm already overusing my time, but I cannot but mention the fact that tele, uh, quality structure analysis and conceptual metaphors can be analyzed deeper, can be used uh, for deeper analysis of the conceptual blending process. Maybe it's, it deserves a separate lecture because some people are interested in conceptual blending when uh, one mental space is blended with another mental space and when the blend, the third mental place, is um, formed, every metaphor actually is a blend because it's a combination uh, of mapping operations between source domain, target domain, and also we have the third domain, which is called blend, where all these components are blended. It's not a mere sum of components, it's not a mere combination, it's an emergent and new structure. And I'd like to give this example of climate canary, but I understand that I don't have much time. I thank you for your attention, and I would really be happy to continue our talks and maybe to find deeper and finer links between linguistics and artificial intelligence. And the main challenge for artificial intelligence at the moment and for robotics at the moment, from the point of view of a linguist, is of course dialogue. We have uh, approached this um, moment when we can speak with the robot, but only in English. So we'd like to work along these lines and maybe to make them multilingual and to speak Russian and other languages. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vera, for an extremely inspiring talk. And of course, I was very happy to see the very close connections between the notions of embodiment and language, uh, because language is always viewed as a very high level cognitive ability, <clears throat> very special. But if you think about it more deeply, and I'm very grateful to your, uh, to your ideas that you presented to us, if you think about it more deeply, you find that there are actually very intimate direct relations between this high-level cognitive capacity 
and our notions of embodiment. And also what you said about metaphors, I find, I find very delightful. Also about the change of metaphor, you know, like for time, and now we use the computer, uh, you know, as, as, a, as the uh, metaphor. And I think humans have always used technology. I mean, technology has always been sort of a favorite domain from which to draw actual metaphors. <clears throat> you know, like the heart being a pump, the brain being a telephone switchboard, the brain being the internet, the human being like an input processing output, uh, you know, computer, so to speak. <clears throat> so thank you very much. I think we can open the discussion now to the uh, global lecture hall. I'm sure you will have <clears throat> comments or questions to Professor Zabotkina. Are there questions from the Global Lecture Hall? <clears throat> right, so maybe uh, is anyone? OK, so maybe we can come back to the question that you were asking at the beginning at the, what was it Vygotsky uh, about the relation was it about the relation between words and mind what's behind thought what's what, behind thought what's behind thought yes 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 yeah okay so, so we have a, we have a statement here uh, in zurich uh, yeah we have one there and then maybe you okay yeah go um, ahead so I actually think that uh, the thought is formed in words. Uh, I truly believe that it is, and let me explain why. Um, when we think, we invoke some information from our memory, and sometimes, not sometimes, always, this information is overloaded with our emotions, with um, images we saw, with um, feelings. That's just a lot of information to operate. So I believe that words actually act like placeholders or like variables for this information, for concepts. So it's easier to operate in these variables, words, than in actual memories, uh, experiences. Okay, very good. Yeah. So thank you. So we can, have... I, can I, okay. Oh. Can I just react to that Vera, quickly? Okay. Vera, would you like to comment on this? Yes, I'd like only to react quickly to that. It's absolutely right. And again, we refer to Vygotsky, who said that the thought is, or the thinking, is actually processed in the words, and we cannot do without words. And he said that between the vague senses and the pronounced word, there are several stages in time um, that take place. And he speaks about inner speech. And that's very important, that first we have vague senses, then the vague senses are sort of grouped into some kind of clusters. And then we come to the uh, moment of inner speech, which is part of memory. And only then we produce uttered words. So several uh, stages, but of course it's all very quick. Thank you for this comment. OK, thanks for the comment. So we have another one here in Zurich. Yeah. Um, hello? Okay. Um, I would like to add that I think that we use words to um, better think or um, perform certain tasks, but we certainly can think without words, like um, little babies or something like that. They don't have a representation of the world, uh, and they certainly have no words to describe something. And I think they imagine something, and they certainly think about things. And also animals maybe think about it. Uh, without using words. So I think we can actually um, use our brain without using words. And if we define thinking as just the electrical interaction between our neurons, uh, we can do that without words. Okay, so we have a different perspective, Absolutely. Vera. Can I also uh, comment to that? Yes, it's known and it has been proved already that we can think without words by images. And the word um, gestalt is well known in psychology, but we're using it in language as well. So we think by gestalt. So we don't always necessarily employ words. And it has been proved that um, it's also possible to use the word without concept. It's also possible some, uh, you know, interjections 
uh, some other sounds which don't have concept behind them. So this is an interplay between concept and word, and I agree, agree absolutely. Another thing, a child uh, is developing or formulating conceptual system, uh, and the process stops at 15. A teenage. Uh, that's what Vygotsky says. That all the conceptual system of a child or a human being are normally formed by the age of 15, 16. That's important. It's just uh, a note. Right. Thank you. Okay, so maybe we can take one last question again from Zurich. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, last question. This is maybe. completely different. So my question is a quite pragmatic one. Um, how? Do your insights from cognitive linguistics apply to the general theme of the Shanghai lectures? Or, I mean, um, uh, what are the benefits of applying them um, to building um, robots, for instance? Okay. Yes, Vera, uh, thank a you. challenge. Well, first, uh, first um, uh, of course, uh, there is a close link between linguistics and machine translation, and this qualia structure, which I explained, uh, is already used in machine translation. But uh, maybe a major challenge is how we can, by using uh, the research from linguistics, generate speech from um, and dialogue with the robots. So I mentioned that the dialogue with robot is still uh, at the initial stage. And also, uh, we should uh, think about a very important, a very important problem: disambiguation of polysemy. The word has several meanings. Very few words in language are monosemantic; most of them are polysemantic. They have many meanings. How do we guess the right meaning of the word? And for the past few years, there have been research in this field. Um, you, perhaps you heard about it: priming and prime. Uh, priming, operation that helps us to guess the meaning, and prime is um, sort of stimulus that helps us to guess the target word meaning. And it may also be used in our um, work with robots. So how the operation of priming, I mean facilitation of the proper guess or the proper meaning of polysemous word um, can be achieved. So, and there are many other, uh, you know, links. Memory. When we speak about memory, again, I mentioned that inner speech is part of memory, and inner speech is something that lingua mentalis we pronounce it ourselves, and it can also be used in robotics. And for the past few years, there's been a research on mental lexicon. You see, words are not in the dictionary, as Virginia Woolf once said. Words are in the mind. So. Mental lexicon has to do with it. How can we incorporate mental lexicon into robots' just uh, structures? These are the questions okay. that need to be solved. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I think we have to close the discussion here. You know, uh, in spite of the fact that I find it very exciting and stimulating. But thank you again, Vera, for a very. In and you can see from the discussion that you know it has been uh, very inspiring, and I'm very happy that you have been with us. Thank you once again. Okay, and see you oh, next week. You. Okay, bye-bye.